बाय द वे गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड हैप्पी साइंस डे थैंक यू एंड माय नेम इज चैतन्य मुंगी एंड आई विल बी अराउंड टू हेल्प यू गाइस विद एवरीथिंग दैट इज हैपनिंग सो मोस्ट ऑफ यू आर फेमिलियर विद व्हाई साइंस डे इज सेलिब्रेटेड बट जस्ट इन केस जस्ट टू स्टेट इट फॉर्मली साइंस डे इज सेलिब्रेटेड इन द ऑनर ऑफ सी वी रामन राइट फॉर इज डिस्कवरी ऑफ रामन इफेक्ट and we celebrate science day to celebrate science and its contribution towards the society on this particular day and uh, with that i know all of you are more excited about listening to various activities watching uh, the activities which are being done so without taking too much time of yours uh, kundan can you yeah so i will just introduce uh, dr kundan sen gupta he is our associate dean for outreach and endowment activities and uh, uh, also dean associate dean for international relations i would just uh, like to welcome kundan and ask him to address the audience with few words about icer and uh, in general outreach celebration hi good morning to all of you welcome to icer pune uh, it's it's a really great uh, pleasure that all of you from so many different schools are here it fills us with a lot of pride that we can you know tell you a little bit about what we do right so i know i hope you are all aware that iacr stands for indian institute of science education and research right so what we are trying to do here is we all are students of science right so we all do science of different kinds it may be you've all heard of the different categories of science say physics chemistry mathematics biology right but you will be surprised to see that in today's day and age a person who is an engineer is doing more biology than a biologist himself or herself right so a lot of engineering people a lot of mathematicians in our institute are also engaged in biology right you may wonder why and how so all of these different sciences have come together and as you heard one of the scientists talking we integrate all these different sciences and you will see how beautiful experiments are conducted in our institute using very very simple and easily affordable things in very much which are available in your house okay so i i i know all of you hate speeches right i am not going to give a long speech i want to make it as short and as as possible so that you can enjoy the rest of the activities that um, that we have organized for all of you today and one important last point i just thought of making here is that whatever you see if it is possible for you to make a note somewhere that's very useful so that you can look it up later also if you have any questions right always ask questions don't become shy about asking anything to anybody who is here right what are you going to say suppose i don't know the answer i'm i'm, I'm going to say i don't know right so there's nothing wrong in saying i don't know but don't be shy at all in asking anything don't ever think that what you are asking is silly or not good and so on never have that you will always find that probably the silliest question are the best questions okay so please don't ever hesitate to ask any questions to anybody who is showing you whatever they are showing you right you will be surprised that most people who also are showing something may not necessarily have the answer to what you are asking as questions and uh, the more we look at it the more we do something with our own hands right you will see that we understand something much better right so you may have seen one video about a scientist i'm just taking one example from what i know there's a plant biologist in our institute and you heard that he works on potatoes right so you know i think everybody has had potatoes at some or the other point in time in their lives right you all know it's called alu right so this alu you may think why is it so important right so this scientist he's actually developed some interesting do you know where alu grows where does it grow it grows underground but you know he's done a very interesting experiment by which he can make it grow above the ground right so how does the potato grow below the ground and what are the ways in which he has tricked the plant you may say tricked as the sense change something in the plant to make it now grow the fruit above the ground right this whole process by which any of these things happen you have you also heard of a very complicated term there 
called long distance signaling right did you hear that some of you may have heard that now what is long distance signaling right you call a call somebody in cell phone in the us is that long distance signaling right so we are talking about signaling here when the word signaling it can mean various things what we are talking about signaling here is how is a certain signal received by different parts of the plant right suppose i take a needle and poke you right you will immediately go back won't you so that is also signaling right that is the moment the needle sharp needle has poked you don't try it now on yourself or anyone right so the moment the sharp needle has poked you you have a response isn't it so that itself is a very very important response if there is something hot near you you see fire you immediately go back right so all of these are examples of what are called as biological signaling processes which we all have bacteria also believe it or not have signaling systems bacteria imagine how small bacteria so bacteria have plants have all living organisms are full of various different methods of signaling that we are people here in the biology department are trying to discover right so we hope that we will have a fantastic day ahead if you have any questions you should certainly ask the people who are trying to demonstrate whatever experiments they are trying to demonstrate to you you may have a question later on after you've gone back home you suddenly think okay i saw this so just drop us an email or just send us a email note i'm sure we'll be able to share with you all our email addresses and contacts and you can come back another day don't think this is the only day that you can come here you can come back any day we are here you have you know where our campus is located come back here you have some questions drop a line we'll be more than happy to share with you whatever we have with us here right so the two things that i just told you was one keep questioning keep asking a lot of questions that's the only way we all learn science our students ask us questions that's how we are able to design newer and newer experiments one question leads to the other there is no end to the process right so this is how you know that today is cv raman's um the celebration of cv cv raman for his major um, achievements in science and raman effect and he also asked a lot of very interesting questions long back when many things were not available in the country and you know he was awarded the nobel prize for his amazing achievements right so this is how scientists who keep asking questions they they then ask those questions and ask okay how can we prove that question how can we find answers to that question right so based on that what they do is they make simple experiments simple models and that one experiment can lead to a thousand other new questions right so this is how whether it's a physicist or a biologist or a chemist or whoever it is who do experiments they keep thinking about the question they keep doing the experiment in the lab and that is how you collect a lot of information about the question that you are trying to solve right so using this sort of a simple method i'm sure many of you have done experiments in the school as well using the simple method you will see that they have some really fantastic and fun experiments for you remember them if you can make a note of it and then when you go back home think about it right and then you can as i said come back again and uh, go and go and see whether you can do it at home for all you can right so very simple experiment that you can do with the stuff that you have at home so keep questioning keep doing i think it will be a really fun day and wish you all a very happy science day thank you uh thank you kundan for that wonderful speech and uh, we will not we sure we are not take too much of your time but i would just request uh, dr aparna deshpande who is the center in charge for the place where we are sitting at to just address a few words and officially inaugurate our science day uh, activities thank you chaitanya and thank you kundan for that wonderful speech good morning everyone it is such a pleasure to see all of you here today on this very special day and also after the pandemic we are meeting for the first time so we are more than delighted to have this national science day celebration in person okay so to tell you a little bit about myself i am a physics faculty uh, member and i have a research lab in hcross 
okay and i am presently i am the head of this activity center where our main goal is outreach and what outreach means is the science that gets done in the labs should also reach to common people they should also know what we do why science is done how important it is and also uh, that is one goal and the other goal is also to get all of you students teachers excited about science like kundan sir said the most important thing is to ask questions okay and there are no bad questions and not all questions are answered that's why we are still here that's why there are science institutes worldwide where we have newer questions coming up and newer energetic enthusiastic students out there to find out the answers okay so without taking much of your time i declare the celebration of national science day open and i look forward with all of you to a very exciting day with talks demonstrations and please have a nice walk around the campus and enjoy yourselves thank you acha abhi jin jinone haath upar kiya hai ab batao tum log kya fun aata hai tum logon ko अच्छा ये 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 ना अभी आप लोग क्योंकि सिद्धार्थ आ गए हैं ये क्वेश्चन ध्यान में रखिए टूवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ द डे आई अगेन आस्क यू ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन सिंस सम ऑफ यू वर देयर फॉर द प्रीवियस सेशंस एज वेल एंड दोस आर न्यू we would officially inaugurate our uh, science day event right now and i would like to welcome mr siddharth yavalkar he is from tata technologies and tata technologies has been a long time collaborator for icer pune with various csr programs and other events so i welcome you siddharth and uh, yeah i i would request uh, uh, dr sen professor sen gupta he is a uh, he is our associate dean iro to hand over a small memento to him good morning i think there are more than 100 students in this class so i'm not getting the feeling so good morning okay great much better first of all happy science day to all of you yes so as chaitanya mentioned uh, correctly that uh, tata technologies under its corporate social responsibility which is known as csr is conducting various programs for stem so i hope you are, uh, are you aware of stem stem is uh, s t e m science technology engineering and mathematics so we are conducting various program with icer uh, from almost like 4 uh, to 5 years just to ensure that the main uh, core subjects like which is science technology engineering mathematics are uh, uh, i mean to give you a better feel to you and uh, you will understand it with in a much better way the pedagogy or the method of teaching what icer has designed basically for this is very innovative but as well as very simple as well so if you see most of the equipments i am not sure but most of you might have came for various programs in icer so if you see the most of the equipments or the kits are basically made from a uh, very basic material like straw or plastic which you find in your own uh, you know uh, home so the intention of getting this uh, you know bringing all of you is to make your in or increase your interest towards the science because believe me future is science so there are a lot of activities what we have been doing with icer be it be i rise program or stem ready program which is completely inclined towards this in uh, atal tinkering lab or sunday sessions i th i think there was just one uh, student who was asking about sunday sessions so icer basically conducts regular session on sunday which is like a hands on activity so the most important thing is to actually get the fear of science out of you and as uh, shubhangi said it very correctly that we want you people to actually enjoy this session right so um, without much, uh, taking much of your time i think you you all people are very excited for actually showcasing your innovations and we will also be happy to see those innovations and uh, i also would like to know i mean this is not the end because if you ask me that a typical question is okay we went to icer on this 20th we showcases uh, some good uh, uh, ideas but what after that so uh, i would i like along with icer i would like to also uh, brief you that in case uh, you that ideas are very very innovative you would like to take it forward and we will try to ensure that how that ideas can be you know taken at the next level yes so uh, thank you to icer for inviting me and uh, giving me opportunity to express my view thank you so much thank you sudha and uh, so 
what we'll do is we'll start the various events with the, which is in campus so some of the students have already set up the exhibits along this uh, outside the classroom as well as at another venue which is near the canteen so those of you who want to look at the various experiments and uh, the activities are welcome to do so uh, at the same time around ten, it's uh, already around 10:30 so we would start with the series of interactive scientist uh, talks or scientist interactions which is to be scheduled i would just uh, request delegates to uh, like i mean interact with each other if possible and i'll ask uh, professor dar sir to come for the talk and i'll introduce dar sir as well so uh, for those who are now I, i'm assuming everyone sitting in the classroom is here for the talk I, at the same time this is a free environment so be open to ask questions uh, be open to interact with the scientists which is the main goal at the same time if you want to look at some exhibits you are also welcome to do that which is set up around the campus uh professor dar uh, is one of the most senior faculties at isap pune and uh, is been recently nominated for a well respected award as well but i will not take too much of our time introducing him instead i'll mainly hand over him for his actual talk which he's supposed to give and uh, i welcome all of you to uh, the national science day event as well and sir please okay thank you so i'm very really happy to have this opportunity to interact with you and i chose a topic which is slightly outside the standard purview of the science curriculum but uh, something which you are somewhat familiar with and i thought this is a good place to start something and uh, let us see how it goes okay so i would like to begin by paying homage to the great physicist c v raman whose pioneering work in physics continues to be the source of invitation uh, inspiration for all indian scientists okay but you know this homage is not just words and you flash a picture i think a honest homage to a scientist is to know a little bit about the work they did so how many of you actually know what sivaraman did okay one Five, ten. Okay, so this is a three-line description of his most famous work. You can, of course, learn much more about it later. But Raman showed that when monochromatic light, single wavelength light, falls on matter, in the spectrum of scattered light, there is a small peak at a intensity at a different frequency than the frequency of light which was coming. and this was a great surprise at that time because you thought that something is coming then the scattered light should have the same frequency of course a lot of it has the same frequency but a little bit has a different frequency and this is a key experimental signature for the quantum nature of light so to understand why this can happen you have to appreciate that light has to be made thought of as made up of photons so it was one of the first um, significant uh, evidence in favor of the particle nature of light and it has been very important in quantum mechanics in general but anyway i would like to discuss today about river networks and rivers have been the cradle of human civilization you know all the civilizations different civilizations which came up started with different rivers there is a nile river civilization sindhu river civilization euphrates uh, you know this iraq iraq those regions also had the civilization came up near the rivers and the rivers are important for our environment and the quality of life and nowadays we have to worry a lot about rivers and uh, so this is a map of the catchment basin of ganga river and some of the major tributaries and uh, different sub basins are shown in different color but i thought one picture is not enough and so there are other major rivers on earth let us start by seeing some pictures so this is the sindhu river and you know of course right now it is not part of india but this is the catchment of sindhu river basin and it contains lot of most of pakistan and a little bit of kashmir and a little bit of china also okay this is a, another big river in the world amazon river in south america and this is almost uh, no, all the north of the south america is the catchment of the river amazon and you can see 
there you know there is a major river but lot of other rivers go and join into the main river and uh, this is the mississippi river and the you know all the water which comes into the mississippi river and this consists of almost all of the united states of america so you see that the rivers take uh, a big part of our globe we don't think of the river as just one stream but the all the set of streams which uh, put water into the uh, stream okay so the river network consists of different streams that join to form bigger streams uh, usually one river does not break into two rivers it does you know the water comes it doesn't break into two it breaks into two near delta regions but most of the time the rivers join but they don't break into two so for the moment we will not worry too much and but there are exceptions as i said delta and there are also rivers called graded rivers which one should know about but actually many students don't yet so here is a picture of a graded river so there are a lot of water streams they join and separate join and separate this is like the um, uh, hair of um, girls no in join and separate that is called braided river and this is brahmaputra river it's a very important river of india and the width of this is about 10 kilometers so you know so it's a huge thing okay and uh, this is a picture of another big river it's called lena river in russia and this is the delta of the river i was telling you about the so this delta is some few hundred kilometers across and you can you know, there is some color coded with different colors but we it is a satellite picture but you have lot of stuff like this and uh, nowadays you can go to the internet and just keep on watching all kinds of maps from the top and they are very interesting to watch in much less work than actually going here but anyway so my question here is now can we identify some common properties of the structure of river networks okay so well, what are river networks river networks belong to a more general category called supply or drainage networks so what happens is you have some land water rain falls on it and eventually it flows away into the sea okay so this is called drainage network so drains come and they join up and they form big, you know, bigger drain and they go into the sea that is what a river network is there is an opposite thing which is a supply network so you can have some company like coca cola which makes lot of stuff coca cola is not always a good example but just imagine something which makes and then it has to supply that stuff to all over the country or the world then they make a supply network so what they set up is they set up some you know this thing goes here then it divides in some part is divided and so on and so forth and so we need to make up some these of these networks by ourselves or they are naturally produced and uh, for example in our body there is a blood circulation network there are lot of veins and arteries so the blood supplies nutrients to all the cells all the cells need some energy and that energy comes from the blood and so it is a supply network and the cells produce some waste material and that is also carried by the blood back to some place where it can be processed taken care of and so this is a three dimensional drainage network or supply network while the river network we saw was a two dimensional one so we can of course imagine other stuff but these are the most important ones so of course if you want to know where will the river flow from here to there you need to know a little bit about the topography of the material the height profile and it will flow like this okay but an interesting question is can you tell something about the river network without knowing any geology even if i don't know anything about the local geography can i tell something about some non trivial properties of the river network which is what i'll try to show you and the advantage of this approach is that the same method works for mm, lena river and for brahmaputra and for ganga and so on we don't invoke the particular geology geography of the material you know, of the system and uh, 
So, we can predict some properties of network without the knowledge of geology. Okay, this is what I like to show. So, the actually the networks evolve in time. So, it is not, you know, one should realize this point is important, not at the time scale of human lives, but over thousand of years the river changed their course, some rivers even disappear. So, there was a Saraswati river which disappeared some 30,000 years ago, okay, not 3,000, but 30,000 years ago, okay. Uh, and rivers, you know, they change their course by some 15 kilometers in lifetime or maybe much more sometime. Okay, anyway, some phenomenology. So, what can we say about the rivers? So, the river networks have been studied by geologists and hydrologists for a long time. So, the people who study rivers are called hydrologists. Of course, it's very important for all kinds of applications, irrigation and so on and so forth. So, uh, we have, so network or rivers can consist of thousands of streams. I showed you some pictures, okay. So, one thing which has been useful in discussing river networks is called Strahler ranking of rivers. So, there are some major rivers and some small rivers and how do you distinguish a big river from a small river, okay. So, this was the first question people had to decide and so, what says that, uh, you know, let us start by just getting rid of very tiny, tiny nalas and take worry about only rivers which have flow bigger than some x uh, per year. Because the seasonal variation of water, you, you want to take average over a year. So, in a year if the water flow across a stream is less than something, then I don't, I call it a small stream nala, do not worry about it. But if it is bigger, then I worry about it, okay. So, then start, there will be some rivers which were not there before because two tiny streams joined to form now which is mentionable. So, it is called a river of rank 1, okay. And when two rivers of rank 1 join, they form a river of rank 2. When two rivers of rank 2 join, they form a river of rank 3. But when a river of rank 1 joins a river of rank 2, it remains the same rank, rank 2, okay. A tiny bit of um, river added to an existing river will not change its character or name. So, for example, Alaknanda and Bhagirati join to form something called Ganga. So, the river can change the name when two equal rivers join. You may not change the name, but it is possible to change the name of a river when two tiny rivers join to form a bigger river, okay. So, so this is what it says, the river is joined by a river of lower rank, its rank does not change. So, here is a picture of the Strahler ranking of rivers. So, I just drew some random river network. Here there are two rivers of rank 1, they joined to form a river of rank 2. This is a river of rank 1 and it joins with this still a river of rank 2 and these are 2, 1 joined to 2, 2, two and it is 2 and this one is also 2. So, it becomes 3 and 3, 3, 3. You can keep on doing this. The advantage of this is that this is very robust. It is easy to make this exercise without doing too much work. You do not have to go to each river and measure the flow. You just look at the map and you can decide the rank of the river, okay. Yes, question? <coughs> yes, sir. It remains two, is the bigger of the joining ones. Yes, sir. Yeah, so if uh, you have uh, two uh, rivers and uh, the previous picture that you showed, it was three, uh, three, then two, and then one, hmm. where all the rivers, uh, streams joined, rank one uh, rivers joined, hmm. uh, they still uh, like stayed rank one. So, does it become like uh, less wider or uh, no, so, so how does it like reduce? Okay. So, in the ranking of rivers, we have not taken into account the width of the river or the water flow in the river or anything. We have only taken into account the way the streams join. Okay. It has a disadvantage, but it has an advantage. The advantage is that it is easy to use. 
okay, does not take everything into account. Okay, when two rivers of rank 1 join, they become river of rank 2, not the other way around. Okay. So, now there are many regularities of, of seen in river networks and these are non-trivial. So, there is one law which is called Horton's law, says rivers of rank 1, if you take a typical picture, see this is not good but it is a picture and you can see there are lots of rivers of rank 1 and there are fewer rivers of rank 2. So, you can ask what is the ratio of numbers of rivers of rank 1 divided by number of rivers of rank 2 and the ratio of numbers of rivers of rank 2 divided by numbers of rivers of rank 3 and so on. It turns out that this ratio is usually a constant, it is around 4 in all river networks. So, this is a very non-trivial observation which you should be able to explain. Okay? because it is valid for all kinds of river networks. Okay, there is another law which is called Hex law which says that suppose you sit at some place in a river network and you try to go upstream and you know when you go upstream there may be some bifurcation so you may go this way or that way. Take the branch which lets you go farthest up. So, it is called the longest upstream length. Okay? So, for each point there is the longest upstream length and there is also the water which flows into the river at that point. And the law says that the length of the longest upstream river is related to the area of catchment of the river or the water flow in the river to the power a, where a is around 0.6, it is more than 0.5. The point is that one is an area, one is a length. So, you might guess that the length should be square root of the area, it is not, it is 0.6 power and it is nice to want to understand where this power comes from. So, the question for a scientist is that can we derive these kind of laws from basic physical principles. Okay? If we can do that then we are very happy we understand the reverse a little bit better. Okay. So, this is a model of rivers which was proposed by Scheidegger 67. He said that there is space. So, let us imagine the space can be broken into cells. So, each cell be represented by one point and uh, it is a um, two dimensional space, but there is an overall slope which is let us say downward one in that direction. Okay? And there is a uniform annual rainfall and every year equal amount of rain falls in each of the cells. And all this water which falls on the cell has to go out. So, where does it go? So, it starts from this cell, then it has to go down in that direction, but it can go to the left or to the right. Okay? So, it, with equal probability it goes to the left or right and we assume that there is no water of ev ev loss by evaporation. And uh, at this great point, the direction is down left or down right, and the flowing water from, forms. So, now this is a picture. So, you start from the top, there are all these sides, this water flows down to the left, and this water flows to the right, and you know, sometimes they join up and they form bigger rivers. And then you can see if you sit here, then all the water which comes from all these points, which are um, colored area, will go through that point. So, it is the area of catchment of that river at that point. Okay? All the water in this region will flow through here. And so, for this simple model, of course, it does not take care of everything, but it is a reasonable model of rivers. And if you take this model, then you can actually deduce the two laws I discussed, you know, the Horton's law and the Hex law, they can be derived. They do not work. So, this model is not very good. So, you can improve on the model and get a better model which actually agrees with the observation better. But I wanted to give the simplest way of modeling some such thing and uh, so that is what this is. And so, the, these kinds of natural laws which you see can be derived from the definition of the model as simple consequences and if they do not work, you change the model a little bit. Okay, so, this is the concluding remarks. I, I think this point maybe a lot of you do not need to be told, 
but i think in the world or even in india there is some set of people let us say 15% who believe that uh, science is not good for us you know they say science causes a lot of pollutions and you know life was much better um, when we were monkeys or simple life okay but i don't think that's actually true and i think if you want to have a better future whatever we do we will need more science and not less science okay and the people who sort of are anti science they are actually somewhat hypocritical because they take all the benefits of science and pretend that these are not important but then they um, only focus on the fact that because of science now there are big cities and there is lot of crime you know but of course there is more crime than it in the past let us say but it is uh, you have to take into account the whole thing and maybe there are ways of reducing crime without getting rid of all the benefits of science so there is a very nice quotation i would like to make from douglas adams who is my favorite author so he said that there are some people who believe that uh, all the so called progress of civilization is bad and we were better as monkeys and we should have stayed in the jungle but there are other people who say no 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 even coming to the land was a bad idea and we should have stayed as fish in the sea you know people believe that originally the animals were in the sea and then they came to land and then at some stage from monkeys they came to human beings so how far back can you go in life do you really want to go to the sea perhaps not i think most of you will not this but some of your friend may say something like this and you have to explain to them sorry sorry you are not thinking straight it is not right and uh, we have to have more good science and not bad science i'm not saying all science is good but uh, there might be bad science but you know you pick the good science and not less science okay and the second point i want to make is that cultivating the scientific temper involves the conviction that each generation of human beings can add to the accumulated wisdom of earlier generations so all our purvaj you know people have been very wise they have learned lot of stuff but we can add to their knowledge including einstein einstein was very wise but i can add to whatever einstein was able to learn this is quite opposite to the view point that all the wisdom is encoded in five books and you need to only learn those books and nothing yet can be added to them right so let me just say this much and progress is possible it is not guaranteed but you can do better okay and uh, the last point is what i try to illustrate in this uh, short talk it says that science allows us to get an improved understanding of the world around us okay so maybe you have heard about rivers of course before but you didn't think of them this way and i think this view point is useful and interesting and it says here intellectually exhilarating you know you feel very happy to learn something new and in science you are always able to learn something new and that is the main point and uh, so this is where i will stop and i am happy to take some questions yes i thank you sir for the wonderful talk if any of you have any questions uh, you can ask him right now good morning sir uh, it's my fortune to attend your lecture i have a, a simple question that uh, we are having this mula mutha cleaning projects going on in pune hmm. so is anyone from icer uh, any faculty or any team is contributing in that project means uh, giving advice to the government uh, that how to proceed or their contribution in means scientific way okay. because it's like a 5000 crore project okay yeah yeah i have nothing to say about this i think somebody else can I, i'm not sufficiently aware okay. of the isis involvement in this project okay sir no problem okay
good morning sir uh, could you tell me a bit more about hats law like it had power like the area at power 0.6 yeah so it says length of the longest upstream river hmm. is equal to the area of the catchment to the power a hmm. and a is approximately 0.6 yeah but then isn't it dimensionally a bit that is what i was trying to explain the point is that the length of the river is a sort of a kinky part so the length uh, is called a fractal and its fractal dimension is bigger than 1 and this power is actually 0.6 so you should understand it a bit better and uh, it's a non trivial fact that this power is 0.6 but that's what it is that's what we see and it's an observed law and understanding the law is what we would like to do so it was determined experimentally this was determined experimentally yes uh, i didn't exactly understand the fractals point can you ha ah, no so this is observed it seems surprising and now you want to understand it and the understanding has been achieved but it involves these other concepts which i didn't discuss called fractals and so on and so forth so that you will learn on your own okay thank you sir okay um good morning sir i actually had a question regarding the strailer ranking system Hmm. So when there are two rivers, each hmm. of rank two, hmm. the resulting uh, stream we said would uh, have a rank of three. Yes. But then the volume of water, as such, if we see, it's doubled exactly. Yes. So why not? Why isn't it four? So is the ranking system like an exponential growth in the river? No, no, no. Yeah, it is sort of. But the rank just doesn't say anything about the volume. Okay. Usually, if a river flows along, tiny streams keep on joining the rivers which it didn't draw. okay so the water flow down the stream is a little bit more than a little bit above but the rank remains the same in our drawing the rank is not fully referring to the amount of water flow but it does say that a bigger rank river will have usually a bigger flow okay, okay. thank you sir okay so if there are no more questions i thank professor dar for the wonderful talk